If you look at a lot of what we did to expand lifespan in industrialized countries, it's things to remove bacteria, right? Antibiotics, sanitation, these kinds of things really improve lifespan because it got rid of bad microbes. But at the same time, it also got rid of good microbes too. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hello, my friends. Welcome back. Great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. In my career, I've worked with many people, including elite professional athletes, to improve their health, performance, and longevity. And I'm currently involved in research with a group of nutrition scientists in Australia looking at dietary patterns and mental health. Today, I sit down with Drs. Justin and Erica Sonnenberg, both highly regarded scientists from Stanford University interested in the intersection between our diet, the composition of our microbiome, the trillions of bacteria in our large intestine, and our health. Their work has been published in many of the world's most prestigious journals, such as Cell, Nature, and Science. And together they co-authored their own book, The Good Gut, taking control of your weight, your mood, and your long-term health. In this conversation, we explore the ways in which our gut microbiome influences our health, how the human microbiome has shifted with industrialization, what we can learn from hunter-gatherer populations, the importance of a healthy mucosal layer, the wall that separates the bacteria in our gut from the cells that make up our intestinal wall, how the microbiome interacts with the immune system, why loss of bacterial diversity is a problem, why some people with chronic inflammatory conditions may feel better reducing fiber, their thoughts on an animal-based low-fiber diet, fermented foods, probiotics, and so much more. Safe to say this one is jam-packed with information. Please do enjoy the episode, and I'll catch you on the other side. Erica and Justin, welcome to the show. Great to be with you. Yeah, thanks. Really been looking forward to having you back on, Justin, and, and Erica getting yourself on for, for the first time. And it's, it's 6.45 or a little after that a.m. here where I am. And I was just thinking, and this wasn't the, the first question I was going to kind of lead with here, but we, we hear about fasting and, and there's various labs like Sachin Panda's labs looking at the metabolic effects of fasting. And I was curious, do, do the microbes in our gut, do they also like to, to go for, for periods without food and, and to have a bit of a break too? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, we, um, you know, I think for a fast to really register with the gut microbiota, it would have to be for, you know, an extended period of time, just because what's, you know, running through the distal part of our GI tract, our colon is probably somewhere on the order of 24 to 72 hours for most people after we've actually consumed it. And so there's quite a lag between when we eat something and when um, the bulk of the microbes in our gut, which are in our colon at the far end of our, our digestive tract, when they would actually experience that food. And so um, for the microbes in our gut to really register a fast in terms of um, there not being any food there, it would need to be um, an extended period of time. The you know there are other ways for fasts just through the um, impact on host metabolism to potentially register with gut microbes, but it would be a different sort of feedback emanating from the host rather than from um, the change in material running through the gut. Mm -hmm. There there um, you know ha there have been some studies on this and and actually good studies like for instance in hibernating animals that go through really extended fasts. And it's clear that the gut microbiota does, does change over a period of no food running through and, you know, what that means for our biology and whether that's good or bad for the bacteria, I think remains to be determined. So, so you can definitely have changes, um, hard to know whether the microbes prefer it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, I often get asked by, by folks, I don't talk a lot about fasting, but of course it's a, a very hot topic. Right. And I often get asked by by people about well what about if you 
if you just drink coffee or or like a matcha tea, for example, that really if you do a black coffee, there's not many calories in there. But my understanding is that these are very polyphenol rich beverages. So they would be interacting with the microbiome in some way, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the the those molecules make it to our um, you know into our whatever doesn't get absorbed in our small intestine can be metabolized by gut microbes and then you know be absorbed potentially into the bloodstream, having a variety of effects. But um, you know, in terms of you know thinking about the bulk of the microbiota, just because there is this you know kind of continual propulsion and, and motility. Um, if you're just drinking, you know, tea or black coffee, you're not providing much caloric input to the community. And so over time, um, the, the community would have to, you know, find either it would be lost or it would have to find other ways of mm. making a living in the gut. And we know that one of those ways can be chewing on mucus and we can talk more about that, but, um, yeah, so the, if you're basically putting anything with those sorts of, um, chemicals, polyphenols, whatever in your mouth, um, there's a chance your microbes are going to metabolize it and do something with it. Yeah. I was, I was listening to one of, uh, Erica, one of your talks, and I was fascinated by this idea that if we don't feed our microbiome, that essentially it can start to, to eat ourselves. And you just kind of alluded to that there. And I definitely want to explore that. Perhaps we, we take a, a step back just for anyone who is tackling this topic here for the first time, it's obviously been a topic on this show uh, a few times, but maybe someone is is hearing microbiome or microbiota for the first time. What do these sort of very interesting words actually mean? Well, for us, we use the term microbiome and microbiota interchangeably. And what we're referring to is the collection of bacteria, microbes that live inside our digestive system. And so microbes actually colonize the entirety of our digestive system in our mouth all the way through to our colon, the very end of our colon. But usually when people refer to the gut microbiome, they're talking about the community of microbes that lives in our large intestine or colon. And that's because that's where the majority of these bacteria live. So even though we have microbes in our um, stomach and our small intestine. Um, most of the work, scientific work, has been done on the microbes that live in our colon. So, tell me about the relationship between the the bacteria in the, in the colon and our own physiology. I know, growing up as a kid, I used to hear bacteria, and I thought, "Ooh, that's a germ." You know, we don't want that. And so, I'd love to understand a bit more about this relationship. And, and also, this may seem like a silly question, but what would happen if we didn't have microbes? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, like you, I grew up also thinking about bacteria as germs. I mean, you get sick and you take antibiotics, that's supposed to kill bacteria, right? So we're all sort of grow up thinking that bacteria are bad things. But really, you know, most microbes are in fact uh, either beneficial or benign, don't really do anything. It's a small percentage of microbes that actually cause disease, but of course they get a lot of attention because of the problems they cause. But really the, the human body is not just a collection of human cells. We're actually a composite organism. We have our human cells, but we're also host to a huge number of microbial cells as well. And so this ecosystem between our human cells and our microbial cells is, you know, really an, a fascinating um, field of study to understand how these two parts of our biology, our microbial half and our human half work together um, and how these two halves can, um, we can adjust, you know, how they're functioning so that each side functions better and leads to better health. And just to add to that, you know, I think this question of like, what, what would it look like to not have a microbiota or to not have any microbes? Um, it, you know, we have to consume food, food has to pass through a di digestive tract. And um, of course, until recently, it wasn't possible to eat sterilized food. So microbes are everywhere. And so 
um, just by virtue of the fact that we're consuming, you know, things in the environment, these foods, we're going to be consuming bacteria. And so that means the bacteria can um, transit our digestive tract. Ones that are adapted to take up residence there can start to live there. And it would just take an overwhelming immune response, so much energy to put into the immune system to try to cleanse this, to cleanse our digestive tract and keep it, keep it sterile that, you know, over evolutionary time, we've worked on this relationship where we can have microbes there that by and large, don't cause disease and help exclude many of the pathogens that do cause disease. And so I think the, you know, one way to think about this is over evolutionary time, we have cultivated a relationship with a group of microbes that can, um, on the one hand, exclude pathogens, take up the niche space in our gut and kind of occupy it. So they provide competition for the bad guys. And then the beauty added on top of that is these microbes um, can do all sorts of other wonderful things for us, like um, help us digest food and, um, you know, synthesize molecules that um, appear to be important for our health. And, you know, then and a lot of other things that have happened, um, you know, over the course of evolution where we've actually become reliant upon the signals in, you know, that our microbes produce for different uh, aspects of development and metabolism. So another kind of very basic question uh, from me here, and excuse me if this is again a, a silly one, but uh, you, I'm wondering, we talk about bacteria helping us digest parts of our food and, and the indigestible components of carbohydrate in particular, uh, fiber. Why is it that that we have outsourced that? Why can't our own cells perform that function? Yeah, I mean that's a great question. If you if you look at the capacity for degrading complex carbohydrates that the microbiome encodes, it's just massive. It's you know tens of thousands of genes compared to just a handful of genes that we encode. So it would be a pretty big endeavor on our human genomes part to try to encode all of this. The other thing, um, advantage to having, you know, it not encoded within the human genome is because, you know, you're sort of stuck with your human genome that you have at conception. Um, your microbiome is actually adaptable to your environment. So your microbiome can more closely match the carbohydrate environment of your food. So for example, say you grow up in Japan and you eat a lot of seaweed. We know that there are microbes that are able to degrade these complex carbohydrates found in seaweed. So if you just pick up one of those microbes, now you're able to use that carbohydrate source as, as a nutrient source for you. But if you grow up in another part of the world where seaweed isn't part of your diet, your human genome doesn't have to worry about it. You just don't pick up a microbe that encodes that. You instead pick up microbes that encode um, the degradation of the carbohydrates that, that match the diet mm -hmm. that you're eating. So it, it does provide this advantage of, of having, you know, sort of a, a, a bespoke microbiome or a bespoke capability to degrade the food source that you are actually consuming at that time. And if you grow up in the U.S. and you move to Japan, you can potentially pick yeah. up a microbe that helps you degrade a local food that you might start eating partway through your life. So it is this really malleable component of our biology that can um, adapt to aspects of our diet. Now that that presents a vulnerability to this um, malleability and that uh, microbiota can um, deteriorate and change potentially in ways that are not beneficial to our health. We can talk more about that, but, um, but it does represent an aspect of our biology that is um, malleable and therefore advantageous in certain. Sure. Respect. Yeah. I mean, there's hope in that, right? There's opportunity to, to kind of modulate and, and restore it, which is of course what a lot of your work is centered on. Um, I'm curious, going back to early scientists in this field, like you guys, but some years ago, when were the first scientists really starting to learn about the microbiome and, and, and identify and that it was there and fully appreciate this relationship that you're talking about between microbe and human? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can go back... Um, uh, 
hundreds of years. And in fact, the you know first description of bacteria by Van Leeuwenhoek was actually uh, a scraping off of his teeth that he was looking at under the microscope, a component of his his oral microbiome. And so, you know, the um, uh, over a hundred years ago, there were studies showing that uh, if you change the the diet in dogs, you can change their gut microbes. Um, and then, uh, kind of in the um, 70s, 60s, 70s, there was a burst of. Um, of uh, really beautiful science where microbiologists started to isolate different bacterial species from the gut, study them in more detail. And, um, and that really um, carried through and kind of um, grew into this expanding field of microbiome science that really exploded kind of um, around well, probably, you know, right around the time that the human genome sequencing was being completed, because that sequencing technology that had been used on the human to complete the human genome um, was kind of not sitting idle, but there was a, they were looking for a new, new way to use it, what to turn that technology to, to sequence next. And one of the obvious things was this tremendous um, number of gut microbes that hadn't been well documented in terms of, of um, genome sequence space. Mm -hmm. And so that the human microbiome project uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health in the United States, and then a number of other um, countries around the world funded similar projects where there was just a, a lot of uh, genome sequencing of gut microbes, uh, expanding field of um, metagenomics, where you just kind of sequence all the DNA that's present in a given environment. And when that was focused on the gut microbiome, that really led to this incredible burst in mm -hmm. investigation, understanding how these microbes are, are linked to our health. Am I right that when that the, the human genome sequencing was done, the kind of the, the hope was that that would help explain and help manage all of these diseases of today, but were was somewhat disappointing in, and, and, and also pointed to the fact that maybe there's something else at play here too. Yeah, I mean, it's so you know interesting being in science and you always think that next question that you have in your head is going to be what really, you know, illuminates this great truth and helps us, you know, improve human health and all these things. And what you realize is like, as you answer each question, it's kind of like an onion, right? You peel off and you realize, oh, now that I've answered this question, I realize that there's like 10 other questions that I need to answer to really get, you know, to, to what I'm trying to figure out. I mean, it doesn't mean that we're, you know, these advances aren't happening and we're not having improvements and, and treatments for health, but it does seem to like every time we figure something out, it just unearths a whole new other set of things that just we didn't think about. And I, I think that was the case for the human genome. I mean, that was an amazing endeavor and it, it really did help us understand a lot about human biology, but it did reveal how, um, you know, really only about 1% of the encoded genetic material that each one of us walks around with is the human genome. 99% of our genetic material is microbial in origin. And so if you really want to get to like a human genome, you have to understand all the bacteria that we're carrying around with us too, and their genomes to get a better sense of, you know, our physiology and how it's functioning. Mm -hmm. So let's dig in a little bit into what we understand is a, a healthy microbiome composition, what's unhealthy. Uh, so how do we know what a healthy microbiome is versus an, an, an unhealthy or industrialized, I've heard you use that term, an un industrialized microbiome? What's the, the difference between them? Yeah, I, you know, the this question of a healthy microbiome is a million dollar question, and we can talk about it in, in different respects, because I think context matters so much, like who are we talking about with it, because there's no single healthy microbiome, uh, different microbiomes will um, be you know, health promoting in different people, different populations, different, even within a person, different periods of their life, uh, maybe a different microbiome that's really optimal. And so it's a really complex question. I think that, um, you know, the, uh, you know, to go, to go back to that human microbiome project, the, one of the major goals of 
you know, uh, this field opening up was really to try to identify what a healthy microbiome is. And the, um, the approach, which seems really logical, is to study the microbiome of a bunch of healthy people and just try to distill out the commonalities. And I think, um, you know, and that's, that's worked to some degree. I think we have a, a good understanding of what a microbiome looks like in a healthy, for instance, American. But the question is still, is that really a healthy microbiome? Um, I think that, you know, there, we have kind of a, a new or different frame of reference with a whole set of studies performed by various groups around the world, looking at populations of people that live traditional lifestyles. So hunter gatherers, rural agricultural populations, indigenous communities that haven't um, fully industrialized. And um, what is apparent from these studies is that uh, the microbiome of, of people that haven't been exposed to an industrialized lifestyle looks very different than the typical industrialized microbiome. And it leads to this possibility that through lifestyle change associated with urbanization, things like antibiotics, Western, all sorts of aspects of the Western diet, processed food, um, increased sanitation, you know, a lot of things that I would say probably have benefit to um, in, in, in different ways, you know, antibiotics, of course, wonderful drugs saved a, a bunch of lives, um, but also have all this collateral damage associated with them. Um, and, you know, a lot of the aspects of industrialized lifestyle are like that pluses and minuses, but, um, it appears that, that aspects of the industrialized lifestyle have changed our microbiome over a fairly short period of time for those of us living in the industrialized world. And it brings up this question of, you know, going back to, trying to document what a healthy microbiome looks like. If you document the microbiome of healthy industrialized populations, you may be documenting actually a perturbed microbiota that's predisposing people in that population to different inflammatory chronic diseases. And um, it doesn't mean that the hunter-gatherer microbiome is the optimal microbiome. And that's the one that's going to give us, I mean, you know, of course there are differences in lifespans in these different populations, but it's clear that there's less inflammatory disease and there's probably aspects of um, the microbiome pre-industrialization or that's present in these um, tradition populations living traditional lifestyles that are, um, you know, basically have become components of human biology, our microbial biology, and then been lost during industrialization that represent important aspects of our biology that we need to study and understand and potentially even bring back to um, to confer functions back on us that, that we've lost. So, so that's one way of thinking about the healthy microbiome. There's also this aspect of um, just kind of general diversity, which is an interesting aspect too. That this kind of goes back to one of the earlier questions you had of, of just this discussion of like growing up and thinking about bacteria as being bad. And if you look at a lot of what we did to expand lifespan in industrialized countries, it's things to remove bacteria, right? Antibiotics, sanitation, these kinds of things really improve lifespan because it got rid of bad microbes, but at the same time, it also got rid of good microbes too. And so while, you know, nobody wants to go back to a pre-antibiotic world or a world where we don't have access to clean water now, because of the, what we know about the microbiome, we understand that in getting rid of bad microbes, we probably also got rid of good microbes, mm -hmm. you know, good bacteria that we were consuming along with our food and water that was less sanitized, you know, a hundred years ago. And that has resulted in a decline in the diversity of bacteria, the different types of bacteria that we house within our guts. And in general, it looks like when you have a low diversity microbiota, you have in general, poorer health. And so the question becomes, how do we maintain this lifestyle where we're not exposed to germs, pathogens, bad microbes, but are still in contact with the good bacteria that can help grow our microbiome diversity and improve our health. It's a very interesting uh, thing to ponder. How do we balance the, yeah, the exactly. good parts of the modern industrialized world mm -hmm. and, and still try and maintain this diversity and, and 
restore or bring back some of these microbes that perhaps we've we've lost. You mentioned the the mucosal layer earlier. Can we go a little bit into that? I'm I'm interested. Is it as we lose diversity that the mucosal layer begins to become affected, or is this just something that also happens uh, as part of a diet that is low in fiber and, and rich in ultra processed foods? Yeah, it's um, it's a good question. You know that um, so the muc- so just to give some background here, we of course have you know this dense microbial community living in our digestive tract, and then we have. Um, our col- colonic or intestinal epithelium, the layer of, of cells that sit right at the interface of um, the gut, um, very close to this incredibly dense community of microbes. And so um, our cells secrete this mucus layer, which helps keep the microbes at kind of a, a little bit of a distance that serves as a buffer space, the kind of good fences make good neighbors sort of approach to maintaining uh, harmony in the gut. And, um, and, that mucus layer is composed of carbohydrates. Um, it's just what what we make and secrete to you know serve as this kind of gummy gummy substance to to keep microbes away. But um, many microbes in the gut have also adapted to be able to both attach to that mucus layer and to eat it. You know, many of the microbes are really good at eating dietary fiber, the complex carbohydrates in our diet. Um, some of those microbes have um, alternatively specialized or have the additional capability of utilizing mucus carbohydrates. Um, some of them as a backup food source. So if dietary substrates, we were talking about fasting before, um, during fast, we know that a lot of the mucus utilizers become very abundant in the gut because mucus is continuously produced by the host and it serves as this kind of consistent endogenous source of calories for the microbes. Um, and we know that if we deprive of dietary fiber, at least in animal models, um, we begin to see an enrichment of those mucus utilizing microbes in the gut, and we begin to see the mucus layer thin. It actually becomes um, uh, depleted and the microbes appear to move closer to the host tissue. And in doing that, um, start to incite markers of inflammation. And so at least in animal models, it appears that a low fiber diet can lead to depletion of this mucus layer. Um, and you know, these are studies that have been done over short periods of time, like a month or something like that. You start to see these markers of inflammation come on. And it leads to this question of what happens in a society where you have undergone you know, a, a huge reduction in dietary fiber consumption and, um, you know, have an entire population over generations eating low fiber diets. Um, you know, could this mean, could, could this be part of the explanation for why, uh, for instance, um, inflammatory bowel disease rates are going up at a pretty tremendous rate in industrialized countries? You mentioned inflammation there. And I get the feeling that's a bit of a, a key word when it comes to the microbiome and also a possible explanation for how the microbiome could contribute to various disease states, these chronic conditions that uh, we see you know, very much the diseases of today anyway in developed countries. Can you break down inflammation for me what what is inflammation and why is this a, a problem and a potential sort of uh unifying way to kind of explain how the microbiome may be involved in these various disease states you want to take a crack at that sure i mean <laughs> inflammation you know the way that me as a microbiome scientist thinks about it is like our body's way of um paying attention to and trying to make the calculation of good versus bad bacteria. So, you know, Justin mentions this mucus lining, the microbes, you know, the human is humans are basically a tube. And so, which is our digestive system and our body knows that it needs these microbes 
And so it's trying to keep it within this tube. The last thing that we want are these bacteria to like breach the tube, get into our circulation and cause a systemic infection. That's, that's a horrible scenario. So our immune system is paying attention to sort of what's happening within that tube. And if it gets the sense that a microbe is behaving badly, like secreting toxins or just causing trouble in the gut, it will say, okay, this microbe is, is not behaving well. I'm going to set off this inflammatory response, this immune response to keep that microbe in check. Or maybe it senses these microbes within the colon are just getting, the mucus is getting thin. They're getting really close to that intestinal lining. This is making me nervous that these bacteria are going to breach that lining and get inside my the bloodstream. I'm also going to set off an inflammatory response to push those microbes back into the gut and keep them out of the system. So it's it's a tool that our immune system uses to control the community of microbes that that we're um, that we're dealing with. And you know this could is important for the gut microbiota, but it's also important for infections. If you're you know infected with a virus your immune system needs to take care of that virus to keep you from getting sick and dying. And, and inflammation is a way that it does that. And in the past, when we would just be exposed to um, viruses periodically, and we you know, had this immune system that was well-trained, that system would work really well. But what we are starting to see in industrialized societies is that there appears to be our immune system appears to be somewhat misfiring in inflammation. It, it sets off inflammation and, and an immune response in situations that, that aren't a problem. And a perfect example of this is like um, a food allergy, for example, like peanuts in themselves aren't going to kill a person as far as like, you know, it's not a pathogenic bacteria. It's not, you know, anything that should cause a problem. But in some individuals with a severe peanut allergy, our, their immune system has decided that that peanut is life-threatening and it needs to, you know, set off all the alarms and set off this huge amount of inflammation. And so a lot of diseases that are associated with industrialization, allergies, autoimmune diseases, um, even metabolic syndrome and obesity are forms of immune system disruptions where the immune system is totally overreacting to a situation that it shouldn't be paying so close attention to. Mm -hmm. And we think that the microbiome, because it's a bacteria, these microbes that are so close to our, our own tissue are important in, in helping the immune system turn its dial towards you know, how much it's going to react to something or not. And we think in the industrialized world, world, because our microbiome has been disrupted, um, that it's turning the immune system dial in a way that is just making it freak out over every little thing that it comes in contact with. And, and a really important um, kind of piece there that Erica explained in really nice detail is that um, I think commonly people hear about inflammation as a response to an infection, but what is... Um, something that's continually happening that people aren't aware of is this physiologically normal state of inflammation that we exist in. So it's not like in the absence of infection, our immune system is off. Mm -hmm. It's continually responding to little cues. And then, you know, there's a little bit of inflammation and then it'll say, okay, that's not a big danger. I'm going to downregulate it. There are these continual cycles of either ramping up or slight ramp up, slight ramp down, kind of negative feedback loops to kind of regulate inflammation. And that, that physiologically normal state of inflammation, that background level is um, the set point that we can measure now with immune profiling and can change based on, you know, where you live and what sort of, um, you know, things are going on in your life. So all those things can change that background level of inflammation. And, and we think that it's that background level of inflammation, that set point that has been raised in industrialized countries because of 
bad things happening in our gut along with a lot of other things, but that, that raised kind of chronic simmering inflammation is also what may be driving a lot of the, the Western diseases that Erica was talking about. So let me just quickly recap and, and correct me if I've heard anything wrong, but with a, a disrupted microbiome, there's often a, a loss in diversity of the microbes you can get this thinning of that mucosal layer that separates microbes from our own intestinal cells, which we want. And when we get thinning of that mucosal layer, you can see an increase in inflammatory proteins, I'm assuming. You can start to rev up the, the immune system in a, in a way that is unfavorable for our, our health. And then that can or well, the idea here is that that can contribute or predispose us to some of these chronic conditions that have an underlying inflammatory component like cardiovascular disease, various types of cancer, dementia, et cetera. Exactly right. Yeah, you've, you've stated it perfectly mm -hmm. there, Simon. I think the, um, the uh, question is, what is the normal level of inflammation? for? Because the, you know, the, having an immune system that's ready to respond to pathogens or even to vaccines to mount a good response to a vaccine, which is on a lot of people's minds right now, I think um, is is super important. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there's a emerging field called systems immunology, where it's, you know, instead of looking at one marker or another marker of the immune system, it's trying to get a comprehensive picture of the immune system and really trying to understand where do you want that set point to be for the different parts of your immune system system to react optimally in these different situations. And if you're, you know, fighting an autoimmune disease, it'll likely be a different set point than somebody who's, for instance, entering, um, uh, um, for instance, immunotherapy for cancer or something like that, where you do want the immune system to rev up and respond to um, a malignancy in, in that case. So, so the, the, this question of like, where should our immune system be? Um, is a is a major one, and it will undoubtedly depend upon who the person is and what they're trying to accomplish. Is it just long life? Is it to deal with a specific condition? Um, you know, it'll totally change where you want your immune system to be situated. Sure, I'm sure that you've given some thought and probably been asked before about cause and effect, and. This gets me me wondering how certain are we that it's the microbiome and revving up the inflammation that then causes the or contributes. Uh, there may be other contributors, but at least plays a part in the development of that pathology versus the disease state occurring first and then influencing the gut in the reverse order and, and causing a loss in diversity and uh, increase in inflammation. You know, anytime I have a question like that, I feel like the answer is always both. It's probably <laughs> both things, right? Because it's a circle. It's, you know, your immune system is paying attention to your microbiome. Your microbiome is responding to what your immune system is doing. And so if you, if you for example, get an infection, a viral infection that increases your inflammation because you're trying to fight that infection. Your microbiome is aware that that's happening and it could influence, you know, the community of microbes that's there. And maybe that community of microbes then dampens that inflammation. Maybe it, it ramps it up. And then you get into the cycle of the communities ramping it up. And then the immune system, because it's all ramped up is changing that community. So it, it does, it can form this circle and it's hard to, sometimes to figure out like, how did it all get started? Um, I think it's just important to understand that these things interplay with each other. And it could be that to, to get someone out of a pro-inflammatory state that's promoting something like inflammatory bowel disease, you may have to push on multiple levers at once. You may have to adjust that person's microbiome at the same time as you're trying to dampen their immune system, you know, using medication. And, and if you can do things at the same time, you can get that person out of that pro-inflammatory cycle that, that may be tough to break with just, you know, going after the microbes, for example. And, and to just take a step back to kind of the basic question of causation, I think it's a super interesting question that a lot of people in the field have really grappled with because, 
there are all of these associations, whether it has to do with inflammation or obesity, or, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of associations, both in animal models and in humans, where you see there's a disease state that corresponds to a microbiota that doesn't quite look right. There's different elements, either different species or different functions that are overrepresented. And, um, the, you know, the, um, classic way, if you have um, a pathogen, for instance, a, a sp particular bacterial species that you think is causing a disease, the classic way of establishing causation is by fulfilling something called Cook's postulates, a set of, um, of uh, principles that you need to um, meet and formulated by um, Robert Koch, an uh, uh, incredible uh, scientist and physician. And, and what he said is, if you want to establish that a, a particular bacteria or another um, infectious agent causes disease, you need to isolate it from a diseased person, um, have actually have it in pure culture, so completely isolated, um, then administer it to a healthy organism host organism and show that you can induce that disease. Mm -hmm. And then even better, if you can eliminate the pathogen and cure the disease, you've gone even one step further in fulfilling that this single organism is causative for that, that disease. Um, when you're dealing with an entire microbial ecosystem, you know, hundreds of species, it becomes a more difficult question. Like how do you fulfill those sorts of postulates for causation? And um, a really beautiful experiment performed by Jeff Gordon's lab, um, uh, approach this for obesity, where they had a mouse model, different set of microbes in the obese mice. And they were asking this very question, are those microbes there as a result of obesity or are they contributing to or causing obesity? And so the really beautiful experiment they did was to take that microbiota from the obese mouse and put it into a non-obese mouse, a mouse that actually had no microbiota known as a germ-free mouse, that recipient mouse, then they could test whether receiving that obese microbiota was sufficient to drive obesity. And in that case, it was. So incredibly, those mice ate exactly the same as their healthy counterparts, but just having this obese microbiota is what was enough to cause those mice to become obese, to gain weight more rapidly. And, and so that is an example of a type of experiment that can be done to address this question of, of causation when it comes to the microbiota. But you do need um, an animal model or um, another way to, to test this in a sort of a, an entire ecosystem transfer model. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting study. And that's also a good reminder. We've zoomed in, I guess, on inflammation, but it's, it's clear, or at least from my reading of the science, that the microbiome is influencing disease states potentially through other risk factors such as obesity or um, you know metabolic type of uh, pathways and that gets me uh, interested to, to have you comment how how does the microbiome affect metabolism and uh, hunger or contribute to something like obesity what what do you think could possibly explain that? Um, you know, the microbiome, it, so, and this probably relates to um, a little bit of background that um, we should have stepped back at the beginning and, and covered before even talking about the immune system and inflammation, but the, the gut microbiome has so many ways of influencing um, host biology. So in a very, in a very simple sense, from the standpoint of like, you know, energy harvest from diet, um, microbes can degrade these complex fibers, for instance, and then utilize the, the sugars that make up those complex fibers. In fermenting those sugars, they actually produce short chain fatty acids, things like butyrate that can then be taken up into our host cells, into our bloodstream. And those can actually serve as calories. So probably not a huge part of calories of the Western diet, but certainly the microbes help us salvage some calories from complex fibers. So on the one hand, caloric harvest is part of the equation. Probably a bigger part of the equation are other signals that the microbes send to us. So the microbes are constantly making interesting small molecules as part of their metabolic spinoff. They make little patterns, um, little molecular patterns, part of their cell wall and lipid membrane structure that then again, 
interact with, you know, get absorbed into our cells, into our bloodstream and trigger different receptors, different pathways in a variety of cell types in our bodies. And this can lead to changes in immune status, in metabolism, in signaling to the brain, um, and, and certainly influence things like, um, you know, uh, satiety, how our liver is metabolizing different substrates and so forth. So one of the I would say very difficult things in the microbiota is to establish exact molecular mechanisms just because the community is so complex. And when you talk about the biology of hundreds of species of microbes and then the 20 some thousand genes that the, the host in, you know, uh, possesses and the proteins that are encoded from those, the, um, the biology is just incredibly complex. And so we don't know exactly how gut microbes are causing obesity, but we do know from the um, microbiome transplant experiments that they are able to cause obesity. It's just a matter of now trying to map the pathways that are involved. Super interesting. And you mentioned brain there, and I, I got sent to study about a week ago, I haven't looked through this study, and uh, admittedly yet in detail, but I thought it was interesting. On a, a quick glance, it was a randomized controlled trial that looked at eighty five percent dark chocolate. I'm not sure if if you've seen it. I can send it over, and they were looking at the uh, microbiome diversity and also mood. And in general, they saw that in the, in the group that was fed this 85% dark chocolate, which is presumably quite rich in polyphenols, it did increase the diversity of the microbiome and did improve mood state. So uh, potentially an, an interesting study to kind of dig into. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's great to hear that the effects are positive. <laughs> <laughs> we can keep some keep some chalky in the uh, in the diet so let's let's talk about let's talk about food and 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 restoring microbe diversity when it it comes to our diet if we want to encourage this very rich diverse ecosystem of trillions of bacteria in a beautiful balance that are rewarding us they're keeping helping keep that mucosal layer nice and and thick our intestinal cells are happy they have an energy source, inflammation's down. What are we doing from a, a dietary point of view? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question and something that our lab is, is actively studying. Um, if you look at all the data from both animal studies and now some more recent human studies, it looks like there's sort of two factors of diet that have emerged as important for a healthy microbiome. One we've talked a lot about, which is dietary fiber. So these complex carbohydrates we know is what these gut microbes rely on for their energy source. Um, we, our human genome doesn't encode much of a capacity to degrade them. So it's clear that we have rely on our gut microbes to digest these complex carbohydrates. Then they create all the small molecules Justin was talking about, short chain fatty acids and other chemical compounds that um, affect our physiology. So a diet rich in complex carbohydrates seems to be an important facet of maintaining a healthy microbiome. The other aspect of diet that has a, that looks like is going to be very important is the consumption of fermented foods. So these are foods that contain live active microbes, um, that when people consume that food, it both lowers inflammation in general, and also increases microbiome diversity. And so it's sort of that, again, back to that good and bad microbe situation, you know, in the industrialized world, we don't want to go back to a place where we're not, we don't have access to antibiotics and we're, we don't have access to clean water, mm -hmm. but we also need to make sure that we're exposing ourselves to microbes because that's from an evolutionary standpoint, what our mm -hmm. body is expecting. It's expecting to see microbes on a daily basis and fermented foods we think is an easy and safe way to expose yourself to microbes in a way that's beneficial and doesn't expose ourselves to disease causing bacteria. So fermented things like dairy products, yogurt, 
Um, and then fermented vegetables like sauerkraut, kimchi, these things are just teeming with healthy bacteria that when people consume them on a regular basis, um, improves microbiome diversity and, and helps with inflammation. And, and we can also talk about like what, what is good to not have in the diet that may be beneficial for the gut microbiome. I think the, you know, Western diet, it turns out is, um, probably a model of what not to be eating when it comes to trying to foster a healthy microbiome. There's, um, you know, high sugar is probably some, you know, or high glycemic foods, you know, simple starches and things like that are probably, um, problematic in multiple respects. One is providing a really rich um, kind of bacterial media environment in the small intestine. And we know that SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and other small bowel disorders are becoming um, more prevalent in um, industrialized countries. And this corresponds with just eating a diet that's really rich in simple nutrients. And if those simple nutrients exceed the absorptive capacity of the small intestine, that is, we can't get them into our bloodstream fast enough, it really creates a rich nutrient environment for bacteria to grow very rapidly within our small intestine, which is probably a huge deviation from the diet that humans had for most of our evolutionary history, which is a diet rich in, in plant material that has relatively low glycemic index. So, so I think that, that the simple nutrient diet may present a lot of problems for small intestinal microbiota overgrowth, um, and, and weird metabolism to be occurring. I also think there's just, you know, a lot of emerging data associated with emulsifiers, these chemicals in processed foods that increase uh, shelf stability, um, that appear, these appear to be problematic from the standpoint of uh, disrupting the mucus barrier. Artificial sweeteners appear to be um, problematic from the standpoint of misregulating the microbiota in various ways. And that can lead to metabolic syndrome, for instance, in animal models. So um, there's a lot of things that um, we're missing in our diet that mm -hmm. are beneficial for the gut microbiota. And then a lot of things that are now included in the, the Western diet that are probably problematic for um, gut biology and the microbiota. So if we kind of work on getting a few more whole plants in and fermented foods, that will start to nudge out, hopefully, some of that more ultra processed food with the, the simple sugars in there. Or so we hope. You mentioned probiotics in fermented foods, and Justin and I did an episode on the the study you did on the on fermented foods and fiber. I want to remind anyone about that. If you haven't listened, go back. There's a lot of detail in there. Um, but that also gets me wondering about you know just foods like an apple. When you grab an apple off the shelf, does that also contain some some live bacteria or probiotics on it or within it, depending on how it's been cleaned or <laughs> sanitized? Probably very, very little. You know, I, I think that um, certainly if you go into an orchard that's, um, you know, an organic orchard or kind of neglected orchard that nobody's paying attention to and pick an apple, you're more likely to have microbes on it that may be, um, may have some impact. But you have to remember that even in that situation, the microbial load will be incredibly small on that apple unless it's partially fermented and rotting there. And I think that, you know, getting back to Erica's point uh, about the fermented foods and the, the study that we performed that showed a positive impact of fermented foods, um, it's not hard to imagine why fermented foods might be so important um, because certainly, you know, for much of, of human history, fermented foods have been part of our diet, but even before we were intentionally fermenting foods, um, you know, we were eating foods that were likely partially rotting continually just because we didn't have great ways of, of storing food. And in fact, you know, the advent of um, beer and other fermented foods quite often was from foods that had just been neglected for a long period of time and happened to spoil in the right way so that they were actually non-harmful and, and still um, edible and, and probably eventually um, beneficial in our evolutionary history. If you go to an apple that's on the shelf in the store, there's probably very few microbes there just because, you know, sanitation is so important in the kind of grocery chain. And, um, and again, you know, to, um, you know, put it in perspective, we have on the order of 10 to the, um, 10 to the ninth, 10 to the 10th. So, you know, on the order of like a billion to 10 billion 
organisms per gram of contents in our colon. And when you go to a yogurt, even where there's known loads of microbes, it's like 10 to the eighth. So on the order of kind of a, a hundred million um, microbes per, per gram. So even in, in fermented foods, the load of microbes is way less than what you'd find in the digestive tract. So as soon as you have a, a scoop of yogurt, those microbes are going to be vastly outnumbered by the microbes that already inhabit your digestive tract. And as soon as you go to a non-fermented food like an apple, um, it's going to be just a, a drop in the bucket. It doesn't mean it can't have a biological role, but it's probably um, not, not really that big of a signal. So more fermented foods. I know that you have some some good tips because not all fermented foods are sort of created equal. I've heard you talk about fridge versus shelf. Also, sometimes I think it can be easy here to get confused with pickled foods that are not actually fermented. Can you kind of give us a bit of your top line tips for choosing fermented foods that are likely to have this favorable effect on our infl inflammatory markers and immune system? Yeah, I mean, the whole fermented food thing is is kind of confusing, especially for, you know, Americans. We don't, other than yogurt, it's not something that is like a common part of the average American diet. So one way that you can tell if something is fermented is most fermented foods will have, um, at least in the United States, a symbol that says live and active cultures on it. And so that's to designate that there are living microbes within that food item. And because there's living organisms in that food item, in general, these food items are kept in the refrigerated section. So as soon as you see um, like shelf stable pickles, like something in the non-refrigerated section, chances are it doesn't have live and active microbes in it because it's um, it's been processed to be shelf stable. Within the shelf stable, there are things that were fermented and then um, sterilized so that they could be shelf stable. And the jury's out as to whether those may have some benefits. There are no mi living microbes in there, but the microbes have um, you know, fermented that food. And so there are chemicals that the microbes have produced that are within that food um, that may have some benefit, but chances are it's probably not as beneficial as if you had the molecules and the actual live microbes as well. And then there's the whole shelf stable food that looks like pickles, for example, but they've just, it's just cucumbers that have been brined in vinegar. And in that case, there, there's never been microbes that have touched those food. And so those are not fermented foods mm -hmm. at all. So, you know, looking for that live and active culture label, looking in the refrigerated section is a good place to start to, to ensure that you're getting actual fermented food. And qu quite often I get asked about sodium and I think it's a good reminder that, that not all fermented foods are high in sodium. Some of the yogurts and kombucha are not as high in sodium as kraut. So uh, there is ways to kind of go about getting a good uh, amount of fermented foods into your diet without having crazy amounts of, of sodium. I've got this kind of uh, vision in my mind here, and I want you to tell me if you think this is possible for the future. But I kind of imagine this future where you can understand the microbiome signature of, of a particular population like Americans or Canadians or Australians and get an idea as to what microbes maybe at a population level people are missing. And then similar to iodine, how we fortified that through the food chain, introduce these microbes into fermented foods throughout the food chain so people are just naturally getting exposure. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that a lot of people have talked about. But one thing to understand is that, you know, the microbiome is this complex community. There's over a hundred different species that live within our gut. And so trying to introduce one or two or a handful of different species in there is not as easy as just like, I'm going to swallow this specific microbe that I know is good for me. And it's going to somehow magically take up residence. It's kind of like, you know, if you've ever done gardening, if you're, you know, living in a desert and you try to put in like a, a fern, it's just not going to do well. And so it could be that 
in order to get these microbes, these sort of what we would think would be beneficial microbes that could help populations into their gut might require a whole bunch of effort to sort of dampen the immune system so that it doesn't reject this new microbe that it's never seen before or provide it specific carbohydrates that we know that that microbe really likes to eat and create a niche within the gut so that that microbe can um, take up residence and, and become a part of the community. It could be that doing that is just way too complicated. And if we can identify the molecules that these beneficial microbes are creating, maybe we just take those molecules. And if we're just constantly consuming those, that might be a way around um, trying to totally re-engineer a microbiome that might be in a really bad shape and may take a lot of effort on multiple fronts to get it to a better community. And, and just to... I- I totally agree with all that. And I think the you, your the vision you articulated would be a wonderful one where we could just kind of have this, you know, distributed network of healthy microbes that would people could access and and um, fortify their guts. Uh, you know, a, a couple things associated with that. One is the microbes that are in the fermented foods are um, you know, typically adapted to those fermented foods and those microbes actually typically don't do well in the gut environment. And so you would need to, you know, take fermented foods that have all the fermented food associated microbes and then spike into that gut bacteria that hopefully would survive long enough on the shelf to where when people ate them, they could colonize. So it would need to be like, a, and, and then you're crossing into this realm of, um, you know, just the practical side of it, the, um, there, there's a bunch of companies right now that are really interested in this concept of microbiome reprogramming and how can we develop cocktails of microbes that can either help fight C. difficile or help uh, individuals that are going into immunotherapy or, you know, these different kind of clinical indications. And, and certainly an extension of that is how do we take people that are healthy and make them even healthier and make them live longer lives without disease. And, um, most of those companies right now are taking the route of drug development where they actually develop a cocktail of microbes and then they study them in phase one, phase two trials, they would be prescribed for a given indication. Um, And so the, you know, I I really love the idea of a, you know, a, a set of microbes that could instill health that would be in food and widely available. But the, the reality is that most of the microbes from our gut that, you know, we would want to introduce probably would need to go through some sort of drug development pipeline before they could be distributed to people because most of these bacteria don't have this, you know, what is generally recognized as safe categorization, which most probiotics have, but gut bacteria do not have. Hey friends, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. A quick message from one of our sponsors who makes this show possible, and then we'll jump straight back into things. If you're familiar with my nutrition philosophy, you will know that I'm a huge believer in plant-rich diets being better for people and our planet. You'll also know that I frequently draw attention to what I describe as nutrients of focus. These are nutrients that science shows plant-based eaters, whether plant predominant or exclusive, can fall short in, which can leave you feeling run down, lacking energy, experiencing brain fog, and generally just not as vital as you'd like to be. For that reason, together with Emil, a plant-based health and wellness company, I formulated Essential 8. Essential 8 is your one-stop multinutrient, formulated with DHA, EPA, Omega-3s from algae oil, vitamin B12, iodine, vitamin D3, iron, zinc, selenium, and calcium to perfectly complement your plant-rich diet. I personally take Essential 8 every morning with breakfast, just two capsules, much easier than supplementing with these eight key nutrients individually. What's even more convenient is I have a monthly subscription, so it turns up automatically on my doorstep and I never miss a beat. To get yours, head to theproof.com forward slash friends. That's theproof.com forward slash friends, where you'll find a link to purchase Essential 8 that will get you an extra 5% off your first order on top of the significant subscription discount. There will also be a link to this in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. Interested to get your your thoughts on something that I've been uh, seeing a lot of online 
And, and I think it feeds into this idea that some people may have more disrupted, damaged microbiomes than others. And uh, Erica, you mentioned there, eating a fiber-rich diet is great to, to feed these and encourage them to thrive, uh, proliferate, thrive, and produce these compounds that we benefit from. But I have seen a number of, of people uh, with chronic inflammatory type conditions, autoimmune conditions, allergy type conditions, turning to an all meat, no fiber, or pretty much very, very low fiber diet. And this is, uh, I guess, on paper, it's sim similar to a kind of low FODMAP diet in principle in that it's an elimination type of, uh, of diet. And you know, I understand why people are doing this because that anecdotally, there's enough people to suggest they are getting a reprieve from their symptoms. They feel better, which is what we all want for for people. I'm just not sure whether it's the the best micro uh, the best dietary pattern for the microbiome and for someone's health in the long term. But I'd I'd love to kind of hear from you. Do you think that there are people out there? who are just missing microbes and are unable to, to bring this, these high fiber foods into their diet without revving up their, their inflammation. And do you think we, we need more solutions and tools to be able to help those people get to a, a sort of uh, microbiome composition where they can handle these foods that everyone is telling them are healthy? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's exactly right. I think, you know, there are individuals where, you know, things have really gone south and they have a lot of inflammation in their gut. And as soon as you eat a high fiber diet, you're, you know, in resulting in more microbes, right? More growth of microbes, more fermentation, more fermentation products. And that can, you know, on top of an inflamed colon really exacerbate symptoms. And so these low FODMAP diets are a great tool for some of these individuals to reduce um, their symptoms and give them symptomatic relief. The key in these individuals is what's the off ramp for that. You don't want, you know, someone on a no fiber diet for 30, 40 years that doesn't seem to be, you know, the path to good health. Um, so how you get individuals to improve the, their symptoms so that there can be a slow reintroduction either of microbes or fiber or some combination of both maybe, um, and slowly repair the intestinal lining and the inflammation and get the microbiota diversity and fermentation that, that we know is beneficial. And, and unfortunately, you know, that is just going to be a lot of clinical trials and research and, and maybe different for different groups of people, how you get them back to a healthy diet. But I think that's right. And, and a lot of people, you know, have emailed us and said, you know, I, I have, IBD or whatever. And I, and I want to eat a high fiber diet, but I just, I can't, you know, deal with the, the pain associated with it and, and just figuring out ways to get an off ramp of that mm. onto a, onto a better diet is something that that's going to be very complicated. Yeah. I think that's a, it's a tough, it's a frustrating position. It must be for someone, right? Because, you know, the, most of the world is talking about the benefits of eating more healthy plants and to be in that position where you want to, but your body's just not allowing you to, uh, you know, that's, that's not a fun kind of position to, to find yourself in. So I, I really feel for anyone that's, that's there is, mm -hmm. is do you think your study on, on uh, fiber and fermented food do you think on the fiber arm that uh, it it was a sort of differences in the microbiome composition that explained the, the sort of variance in the response that you saw? I, I think it it appears to be so. The, and just to go back to your comment about you know feeling for these people that are unable to process fiber because that does lead in nicely to this question. I think you know kind of a a dirty little secret in the field of microbiome science is that. Um, you know, we were, we were talking about how, um, you know, introduction of microbes that might be beneficial 
but we don't have could be tricky through kind of official routes. Um, we are continually cycling other people's fecal microbes through our own digest digestive tract. I mean, it's just a fact of kind of fecal matter being everywhere at a low level. And so we're continually doing a low grade fecal transplant on ourselves. And, um, and I think that the question is when you get a microbe from the outside um, that might be beneficial, how do you keep that microbe as a resident rather than just passing through your digestive tract and leaving? And one way of keeping microbes in your digestive tract and having them set up shop and take up permanent residence is by creating niches for them, creating professions for them to make their living. And that really is eating a diet of diverse fibers. Now, I understand if the fiber degraders aren't there, how do you do that? And so I think, you know, I, I would encourage people that are having these sorts of problems to try to find that sweet spot of where you can have a little bit of fiber in your diet and keep it there for a long period of time, you know, months, maybe years. And over that period of time, the hope is that you'll gradually accrue these microbes. They'll stick as they experience that. And you'll gradually be able to ramp up your fiber degradation over time. You just have to be patient and um, hope to encourage these microbes that you randomly encounter in your life. So, so I don't think it's a hopeless situation. I just think it's one that you need to be diligent about mm -hmm. and you need to keep a little bit of fiber in your diet and try to increase that as possible to try to create the opportunities for the microbes when you do encounter them. And, he, you know, even in our study, our fiber fermented study, these were healthy individuals and they still did a slow ramp of increasing fiber and fermented food consumption because we knew if they, you know, went from 20 grams of fiber a day to 60, they would experience a lot of discomfort. But if you do it slowly over a period of weeks, or, you know, you could even do it over a period of months, you know, your microbiome is adaptable. That's the whole point of this facet of our biology that can adapt. It can, if you can do it in a way that you can manage the discomfort, it's not, you know, making you feel terrible. You just kind of see yourself on this path of like, okay, today, this is what I can handle. And then in a couple of weeks, I'm going to try adding a little bit more of this and sort of get yourself on this road mm -hmm. to increasing, you know, fiber and fermented food consumption. And, and even in our healthy subjects, they needed to do that too, to, to feel okay as they were ramping up. Which makes sense, but it, sometimes in, in practice, uh, you can get a bit excited about changing your diet and you <laughs> totally. can want to change a hundred things a, a, at once. But uh, mm -hmm. do we have any idea as to how different uh, our microbiome is from one another? Yeah, um, it, it definitely is individualized. So, I mean, that's the kind of major backdrop here is that your gut microbiome is a fingerprint. It, does change over the course of your lifestyle or over the co course of your life. And if you take antibiotics or something like that, it can, it can change pretty drastically over a short period of time. But generally, you know, um, if I see a profile of Simon's microbiota uh, today, three months from now, if I'm given 20 different microbiome profiles, I'll be able to tell which one is yours. And, um, and so there are these, you know, species that are, and strains that are, will be indicators of your microbiome. Um, your microbiome will have similarities to people you live with, to people you've lived with in the past, to um, potentially your, your mother over the course of your lifetime, certainly siblings, um, identical twins is kind of the, the closest you can get if you've been raised together. Um, but there are still, you know, massive differences between identical twins. So there's a, a huge um, factor that just kind of environment and random things in your, in your life um, maybe differences in nuances in the diet that can change your microbiome. Now, if you take two people that live in completely different parts of the world or live completely different lifestyles, I mean, the differences are going to make 
differences between two people living in the same city look like they're basically the same person. I mean, they're just, you know, as soon as you compare a Hadza hunter gatherer to an American, it's like, you know, worlds apart. So it really depends on the two people you're, you're talking about, but, but I did want to cir circle back to this question of the fiber in the, um, in the fiber study, because it was, you know, we got, we got these healthy adults that um, have different microbiomes, but it did appear that, the people with the most diverse microbiomes entering the trial did the best on that high fiber diet. And the people with the lowest diversity microbiomes, um, it appears that they, you know, may have had a more inflammatory response to the fiber. And so it, it really seems like they're even a, in a group of people where their microbiomes look generally industrialized, very similar to one another. There are these nuances where a certain subset of those people may be better prepared for dealing with a high fiber diet should they want to implement it over a short period of time. Yeah, I think this is a really good reminder for anyone listening that perhaps works you know, as a dietitian or a nutritionist with with people and most most people are fully aware of this but there really isn't a one size fits all prescription that's going to be a success for everyone and and you've explained these these beautiful characteristics of what a healthy diet is but how to get there might look a little different for for individuals i'm i'm curious as to if someone's listening and thinking gosh this is so interesting i want to like look through a window and see my microbiome. I want to understand the, the the weak points, the strong points. Am I better suited to apples or eggplant or lettuce? Are we there yet? I know that there are various testing kits that are advertised. Do we have the the data and the information to be able to tell people that? Um, it yeah, it's a moment where there are a lot of companies that are trying this, and we haven't tried them all or validated their methods. I will say that there's. Um, you know, one um, very kind of scientifically rigorous, well-accepted um, group that's doing this for um, predicting uh, spikes in blood sugar after a meal, so postprandial glycemic mm -hmm. index. And, um, and there's a group out of the Weizmann Institute that has uh, created a machine learning algorithm for using microbiome profile to predict how somebody will respond in a personalized way to um, a given food, whether, you know, a banana will spike your blood sugar as opposed to me. And there may be a difference that, um, that can be inferred based on our microbiome profile. So, um, so that group is doing this um, very well. It's very scientifically rigorous. There are other groups that are kind of following in, in their footsteps or creating their own methods. Um, a lot of those are kind of a little bit um, um, more immature in terms of um, at least people from the outside being able, like us who aren't part of the, the companies, to be able to assess how good they are. But um, certainly, you know, if you can find what looks to be a reputable company with good scientific papers that they've, you know, posted on their website that they've uh, taken part in, um, just getting a profile of your microbiome is a very interesting thing to do because if eventually, for instance, your health changes or some life event happens to have that baseline profile may be useful down the road. Um, in terms of the recommendations that come along with a lot of these uh, profiles, it's it's very early days for um, those having actual validity for what you should be eating and how it will affect your health. You know, if you want like a very cheap and easy way to sort of keep tabs on your microbiome, you can just, you know, pay attention to your bowel movements. Those are an indication of how everything's functioning. If you have regular bowel movements pretty, you know, fairly frequently, if you look up a Bristol stool chart, they'll show you, you know, the different consistencies of bowel movements and where you want your stool to be, right? You don't want it to be super constipated, you don't want it too runny, that can be an indication as you're changing your diet, increasing fiber, increasing fermented food. If you see that now, instead of having a bowel movement every other day, you're having a bowel movement once a day, and that bowel movement is easier to pass, that's an indication that your microbiome and your GI system is functioning better. So that's you know just the lo-fi way of, of paying attention to your mm -hmm. microbiome. Other than uh, fermented foods, if if someone is missing microbes, 
And so you spoke about fiber. I'm assuming that the fiber is is acting as a food source for the microbes that are already there. But if someone is missing uh, certain microbes, and let's say they've they've had a history of taking a lot of antibiotics, and I guess that's a question in itself: Do antibiotics actually wipe out microbes, or do they just lower the numbers? But if someone is really struggling, they feel like they've lost microbes other than fermented foods, how do you feel about probiotic supplements, for example, or we hear about fecal microbiome transplants, and I wonder if there's a future there where you can uh, walk into a clinic and, and get one of those. What are your thoughts, you know, aside from food and sort of looking after the existing microbes you have around introducing new microbes? Yeah, I, I don't... Um... You know, it's it's a very difficult thing to acquire microbes in like a, a knowledge-based way at this point in time. Um, I think that, you know, there will be ways to get fecal transplants for either augmenting or recreating a microbiome that's healthier if your microbiome is unhealthy. Um, the, the problem is the, and it's not a problem, it's just a, you know, there's a time component to this. There, there needs to be careful study of the microbes, and that includes human trials that show that the microbes can actually have a benefit and don't um, cause, you know, that there aren't safety concerns and, and side effects. So, so there, there does need to be a lot of study to actually get to that point. Uh, you mentioned probiotics. I think, um, you know, the the it, for as long as probiotics have been around in terms of what they do to the gut microbiome, I think the jury is still out. I, I think that there's not really a lot of high quality studies that show a benefit of probiotics on the microbiome. Now, I know there's a lot of data showing that um, probiotics can positively impact, for instance, duration of viral diarrhea, or, you know, there, there's a, a variety of studies out there that show that probiotics can have a, a positive impact on our health. But the rigorous studies that have been done looking at probiotics in the microbiome indicate that probiotics may actually, for instance, slow down reconstitution of the microbiome after antibiotic treatment. Now, whether that's good or bad, it's hard to know. Maybe they serve as placeholders while the microbiome is reconfiguring and help it rebuild in a better way. Um, we've performed probiotic a probiotic study in humans on metabolic syndrome, um, the a probiotic formulated to help deal with the features of metabolic syndrome um, and did not see a positive impact, a, a positive outcome for, for that treatment. So, so I think that, that, you know, that a lot of the probiotic studies have been done, you know, in, um, you know, either by companies that have a conflict of interest or just they're underpowered and underfunded and not, not well studied. And then the marketplace is flooded with really, um, you know, it's just not well regulated and therefore there's a lot, you know, there are good products out there, but there's a lot of really kind of bad products that aren't careful. There's not good quality control for probiotics. So it, it's kind of a buyer beware sort of situation. You have to be careful when it comes to, to probiotics, I think. Super interesting. And am I right that, that most of these are not actually taking up residence? Is that, does that seem to be like a, a key thing that we need to better understand how to introduce a probiotic that will actually stick and turn the, the colon into its home? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a big misconception. People think if they consume a probiotic or even fermented food that the microbes are now taking up residence within the gut. And, um, you know, most probiotic supplements are derived from microbes that come from fermented foods. So if you compare like the label on a yogurt, look at the microbes that are there, you'll recognize a lot of those names from common probiotics. So in, in many cases, they're the same exact species of microbes. Whether those microbes actually need to take up residence to improve health is, is an interesting question. It doesn't necessarily need to be the case that these bacteria have to live there long term. Um, it could be as they're passaging through our gut that they're providing a benefit as they're passing through. And so, you know, that's why we think that, for example, consumption of fermented foods is the type of thing, if you want to see a benefit, you have to do it on a regular basis. You want to have this like constant stream of these microbes. Um, transiting your gut, you know, on a daily basis. And so 
I'm not sure how important it is to pay attention to whether it can stick in your gut or not. I think it could be that the the passaging through is the is the benefit that you're looking for anyway. And sure. you know the one one important note here is that we're using the term probiotic to kind of cap, um, encompass microbes in the probiotic aisle, and and the we should say the formal definition that's accepted by the scientific community are microbes that confer a health benefit when they're um, given it at adequate amounts. And so there are a lot of microbes that are in the probiotic aisle that actually technically don't qualify as probiotics just because they've never officially been studied and, and may not have a positive impact on health. And so this does get back to kind of the science-based, evidence-based method of looking at probiotics, which is to actually understand what strain are you actually taking when you buy a probiotic uh, supplement and um, what are the studies that support it actually being uh, called a probiotic as opposed to just being a microbe that was isolated from fermented foods and then freeze dried and encapsulated and called the probiotic by the manufacturer. So it's important to keep the, that distinction in mind. And, mm. and, you know, the one other footnote here, a lot of these do come from a lot of the um, microbes in the probiotic supplement aisle do come from fermented foods, but there are bifidobacteria in a lot of probiotic supplements that actually were originally derived from infant stool. So members of the infant microbiota, and those have been studied. Some of those have been studied in nice human studies, and it those actually can take up residence in the gut for long periods of time, not in everybody, but in certain individuals, you do see persistence after people stop taking the probiotic, indicating that the microbe is, you know, become a permanent member of the microbiota over the course of, um, you know, the, the, um, study being, you know, these study participants being examined. So there are classes of probiotics that can take up residence in the gut microbiome, but the vast majority do pass through. And again, just to reiterate what Eric is saying, is saying that doesn't mean they don't have an effect. They may have an effect as they're passing through. I think that's fascinating. Surely the the probiotic industry needs to be better regulated. If if you're going to use the name probiotic, you know, as a consumer, you would you're being led to believe that that bacteria has at least been shown in a study to have some sort of health benefit. Um, so to think that that's not the case for all of them is somewhat problematic. I think others will feel the same way on that. Is that the same with prebiotic? Because there are uh, prebiotic supplements and you get prebiotic powder sort of blends. But again, the scientific definition would be a substrate that feeds bacteria and then produces a, a benefit. And, and have all of these prebiotic supplements on shelf been tested? No, d definitely not. And, you know, I think the uh, the prebiotic space is even a little bit more slippery because I don't think there is as, as nice of a definition for what is accepted as a, you know, labeled as a prebiotic. And the, you know, basic idea is exactly what you said, that you're feeding a, a um, beneficial member of the microbiota. But, um, you know, one problem is understanding what microbes these um prebiotics or generally prebiotics are just purified forms of fiber. Um, what member of the microbiota they're feeding, it'll be different in different people. So if you take inulin in you, it may feed your bacteroides and in me, it may feed my bifidobacteria. And so it may encourage totally different bacteria based on, you know, who you give that prebiotic to. And, um, and then, you know, I, I do think that, um, there is the issue of, uh, you know, worrying about prebiotics that they encourage single or a limited number of species, just because if you take inulin, or even if you take, you know, a handful of prebiotics, you have some chemical diversity there, but it's a pretty simple mix compared to if you go to a salad bar and eat a bunch of plants, you have a tremendous diversity of, of chemical structures in those fibers that then can go on and encourage diversity in the gut microbiota. So it's really hard to reconstitute that it, that sort of um, encouragement of diversity and encouragement of diverse metabolism through purified substrates. Mm -hmm. and, and it does seem like just from my kind of noticing as I'm grocery shopping that a lot of products that have a big label like contains prebiotics or probiotics are often products that you wouldn't think of as healthy. And they're, you know, putting these labels in these 
these additives in order to make the the food product seem healthier. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you would never see like an apple with a sticker that says contains prebiotics, right? Because everybody knows that those are healthy things we should eat. But like, for example, you know, there are cookies and all these things now that have prebiotic stickers on them. And it's like a way of trying to make that food items seem healthy when really like there's so many problems mm. and it goes back to what Justin was saying. It's not just adding fiber, but it's also trying to reduce the amount of sugar and emulsifiers and all these other preservatives that are being added to food. Mm. So, you know, layering a bunch of prebiotics on top of that, I'm highly doubtful that that's really doing much to improve the, mm -hmm. you know, the nutrition of that food. And key, key being here that these supplements are not really a substitute for a healthy diet or, or trying to introduce some of these plant foods where you can. But it, it does get, get me wondering, coming back to someone with a, a very disrupted, damaged microbiome that's struggling, let's say, to introduce plant foods. And I'm thinking on the fly here, so let me know uh, if I'm missing the mark. But I mentioned that study before on chocolate and I have seen a few different papers. I think there was a paper out of Italy, the maple study that looked at polyphenol rich foods and the effect that that had on, I think they were looking at intestinal permeability, but there overall, the literature, there seems to be some emerging science looking at polyphenols. And I wonder if these could have some utility for folks who are struggling with the more fermentable carbohydrates would potentially uh, a sort of intervention with some polyphenols to begin with be a way to encourage diversity, similar, I guess, to fermented foods in a way where then they can perhaps tolerate more plant food in their diet later. Yeah, potentially. I mean, I think it, the, um, if if you are in one of these positions where it's hard to introduce whole foods, it's certainly worth trying some of these different approaches. Like you're saying, can you repair the barrier? And then does that allow you to start introducing, you know, fiber at a low level and gradually ramp up? I think, you know, what you're describing is a gradual, you know, kind of component-based approach of reconstituting a plant-based diet, which is interesting. If you start talking about polyphenols and fiber and, you know, different nutrients mm -hmm. like that, what we're talking about is really all the components of a, of a plant. And so the, I, on the one hand, from the scientific perspective, those sorts of studies that, for instance, look at polyphenols in isolation or look at prebiotics specifically are incredibly valuable because you have a way of unraveling single components because if you you know like this study we did with a um, fermented food diet and a high fiber diet it's really hard when you see a response to know what component is playing the biggest role in this really complex matrix of the food that you're asking the the participants to eat and so so they're really valuable from that perspective and then may provide a path back for these people that are that are having problems but um you know it's it's just really you have to be really careful when you go to supplements again just because you know we were talking about people you know the supplement industry using the term probiotic um inappropriately in some cases the other major problem is just the lack of regulation for the safety and quality of those products so you know there have been many studies looking at probiotics most of the products out there, if you just, you know, take 15 products off the shelf, don't have the right number of bacteria, don't have the right number of viable living bacteria, and don't have the right species of bacteria in the probiotic products. Some of that is probably just companies not being careful, but it is difficult to produce pure cultures of microbes in large batches. And so they're just the, and when you produce probiotics, it's really susceptible to contamination. And then there's all the other things that can happen, um, you know, contamination with um, heavy metals and things like that. So I, th I think, you know, you think about going to something like polyphenols, you want to make sure that if you're going to take a supplement based approach, you're really careful about how you source those supplements, because um, as soon as you start purifying things, you run into other problems that you can mm -hmm. introduce. And, and there are probiotic companies out there that are reputable and make, you know, a high quality probiotic. And I think if you are one of these individuals, that's like trying to 
you know, regain your health and, and are working with a dietitian, something like trying a probiotic in addition to other things, like trying to add back more fiber, whatever could be a path back. I mean, everyone's microbiome is different. Everyone's specific health issues are different. And so it could be that there are certain probiotics out there that can really help people, um, you know, on the path back to help. I think I, my guess would be that chances are pretty slim that probiotics in general will be beneficial to the population at large. If you're a healthy person, you eat a healthy diet. Um, my guess is you're not going to need a whole lot of probiotic supplements, but for some of these individuals that are having health issues, this could be, you know, uh, on their journey back to health. And as you said earlier, Justin, probably looking for a company where they're very transparent. Maybe there are some trusted scientists that are that are behind it. To, to try and just tie a bow in the fermented study uh, with the fermented foods that you saw this benefit in terms of reduced inflammation. But as you mentioned earlier, so these participants actually didn't see you didn't see those probiotics in the fermented foods take up residence at all when you looked at their microbiome at the end of the study is that right it was a small percentage and it probably wasn't taking up residence so when we surveyed the microbiome of these people um we saw a bunch of new species and it was only like five percent of those new species that were actually derived from the from or corresponded to microbes in the fermented food so vast majority of new species were not were not detected in the fermented mm -hmm. foods coming from elsewhere while we're talking about uh, food here what what are your thoughts about gluten and lectins these have received a lot of uh, attention over the past decade or so, gluten first and, and now lectins a, a little more. Sort of celiac aside, what's your view on, on the inclusion of gluten and lectins in someone's diet? Are these damaging from a, a microbiome point of view? Yeah. I th well, so to differentiate it in terms of like my understanding of how people think about those two components leading to health issues, I think on the one hand, um, you know, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, it's a big question about how this is operating, but in um, my understanding of it, it's kind of operating in the same spectrum of celiac. It's just not as severe in that it's a um, an antigen, a, a protein motif that's recognized by the immune system and the immune system is responding to it. And we can come back to why that may be a, um, an issue and, and, um, you know, something that certainly a lot of people appear to have, um, have an improvement in their health when they eliminate gluten from their diet. Um, I think on the other hand, the lectin issue associated with legumes, the theory there is that these lectins, um, are proteins that actually bind to carbohydrate structures in the epithelium in the gut and disrupt the barrier and then allow kind of leaky gut to take place. And that leads to inflammation and things like that. And so these are very different mechanisms in terms of um, how the, the um, gluten or lectins would be causing health issues. I think from the standpoint of the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, this may be along the lines of this misregulation of our immune system that we were talking about before, where we have a disrupted microbiome, a lot of other things happening in the industrialized lifestyle that are leading you know, kind of along the spectrum of the hygiene hypothesis, but extending into disruption of the microbiome where we have an immune system that's just hypersensitized to things that normally it wouldn't be sensitized to and responding to them. And so, um, so there certainly is an aspect of um, non-celiac gluten sensitivity that is um, can, can likely be attributed to a uh, misregulated immune system in general. I think it's also the possibility that when people eliminate gluten, they also are eliminating a lot of refined foods from their diet, a lot of refined carbohydrate foods. And um, it could be that some portion of that population is um, experiencing alleviation from fatigue and other things like that because they're actually getting rid of a lot of crappy food and a lot of crappy carbohydrates from their diet mm -hmm. and maybe experiencing less glucose spikes and things like that. So that's just something, you know, if you want to do a, a gluten challenge on yourself, you should buy 
purified gluten and just see if taking that makes you feel bad as opposed to introducing, you know, crackers or something like that, that could make you feel bad for a lot of other reasons. Um, the, from the, the, lectin side of things, you know, one of the things that Erica and I talk about a lot is if you go to these blue zone diets where people, you know, these blue zones are are places where people have incredible longevity and yet very different kind of lifestyles and diets, yet there are some commonalities. And one of the commonalities across these blue zones in terms of their diet is legumes. So, you know, legumes appear to be associated with people that are incredibly healthy and live long, long, healthy lives. I haven't seen, you know, when we consume proteins like lectins, typically they're broken down, they're digested. And certainly if we cook legumes properly and then eat them, these proteins are denatured and and not functional. So the lectins wouldn't be functional. I know that there are studies looking at lectins in cell culture and whether that's relevant to the digestive tract and the biology happening there, I have questions about. And so if anybody can send me a really good quality study of lectins um, and their impact on the digestive system and increasing leaky gut in, for instance, an animal model or something like that. I'd be really curious to see it, but I personally haven't seen any data that really is solid that supports the kind of lectin hypothesis to me. Cool. Well, there's the, the, the challenge. For, for anyone listening that. Yeah, I would love I would love to see the studies. I don't know yes. all the studies out there. I try to keep up on them, but I just, I haven't seen the data that convinces me that lectins are any sort of problem. You know, one, one thing to add on, on the gluten front, I mean, you don't, nobody needs to eat gluten for a healthy diet. I mean, there's plenty of cultures around the world where gluten is just not a part of their diet historically and they're perfectly healthy. I guess the question that I would ask myself is, you know, this gluten sensitivity, is it the cause of my problem or is it a symptom of a larger problem that's brewing? And if it's a symptom of a larger problem, which is this pro-inflammatory state or hyperinflammation in the industrialized world, removing gluten isn't a solution to that problem. It's just, you know, a band-aid on the symptom. And so if you replace your diet with just gluten-free examples of cookies, crackers, whatever, you're not really doing much maybe to address the underlying issue. And so, you know, while nobody needs to consume gluten, we do need to be thinking about what components of our diet are really going to promote a healthy microbiome and a healthy immune system and make sure that if we're eliminating gluten, that we're still maintaining high levels of these healthy foods. Mm, Such a great point. If you remove gluten, what are you replacing those exactly. foods with? So other than eating a, a fiber-rich diet, working in the, the fermented foods, what, what else can people do in their lifestyle away from food that can help positively shape their microbiome? If we come back to, say, the, the Hadza or hunter-gatherer tribes, are there, are there things outside of the diet that we can learn from them, which also likely contribute to the sort of higher microbial diversity that they have? You know, I, I, we've talked about antibiotics. I think there's a lot that we do and um, associated with like our medical choices, which are meant to kind of um, deal with the proximal threat and not think about kind of the the long-term implications of that. And so that this gets back to like people using antibiotics pretty cavalierly when any sort of um, infection like thing arises and, and, you know, whether it's viral or bacterial. And so just for people to be very, I mean, that's like the really obvious thing to do. I think, you know, the sanitation issue, especially in as there's like this pandemic um, that we're all experiencing, we, um, you know, need to be very careful about sanitation and, and making sure that that we're mindful of how germs are spread. At the same time, I think that um, going overboard on sanitation may have a negative impact on our microbial exposures and potentially our microbiome. And certainly if you go out and, you know, play in your yard um, and you don't use pesticides, there are harmful chemicals there. If you go on a walk in nature, um, you know, or even just, you know, playing with your dog or whatever, um, 
you may not need to wash your hands right afterwards. You know, I, I think people are obsessed with, with cleanliness in many situations where they don't need to be. Certainly if you ride the subway or you go to the grocery store or your kids come home from school, probably a good idea for them to, for people to wash their hands in that instance, just because, you know, infectious diseases can be passed around. But, um, but I, you know, so I think sanitation is a, a big one. There's also a, this incredible kind of, um, emerging science of the brain gut axis and how the um our our mental state can feed back on our gut microbiota so the the idea that stress can negatively impact mm-hmm. your gut microbiota and potentially you know taking measures whether it's exercise or meditation or you know however you know you want to um kind of um, keep your stress levels low, you know, enjoying art or whatever it is um, there, you know, I think it's reasonable to think that, that um, that can have a beneficial effect on your gut microbiota as well. Mm-hmm. So I think that you can kind of think about this in a, in a holistic way. And um, I've probably forgotten other things that. I mean, it's kind of all the things that, that we associate with health, like you're saying, stress reduction, um, you know, being out in nature, that might be a way to expose yourself to some microbes being around individuals. Like we know that social interaction is beneficial for our mental health, but what if social interaction is also beneficial for the exchange of microbes between individuals? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of these things that we know are are helpful may have a microbiome component to them as well. Yeah. We probably have a bit to make up on that front, given the last couple of years of, of isolation, uh, Mm -hmm. some more so depending on where you live, I guess. Uh, Leave us here with what you're excited about going forward. What's the the research that you would like to explore or, or be seen performed within the field in general to to fill in some of the gaps in our current understanding of the microbiome and ways to optimize it? That's a fun question. I, I would say for me, it's the human dietary intervention studies we're doing so much of being a basic scientist is doing research on things that you have such a long horizon. Like, you know, a lot of the mouse studies and those kinds of things we do, you realize are like decades away from helping people health-wise. And the human dietary intervention studies are studies that we're doing where because it's humans, because it's food that doesn't need FDA approval, when we get data back showing showing that, you know, for example, fermented foods is healthy, that information can be used by people right now to improve health. So doing more of these dietary intervention studies, looking at, you know, all these different diets that people are trying, different components of, you know, fake meat versus real meat and all these things is just the type of thing that I'm hopeful we can do a bunch more of these and get some cool information out to people really quickly. Yeah. And I, since she took the really good one, I have another <laughs> one that, and it's true. The, these dietary interventions, I think a burning question is, you know, how much of the dietary solution can be distilled down to kind of public health, common knowledge sorts of things that can be, you know, information that can be disseminated broadly versus things that need to be more individualized and how much of the individualized solution can, as we've talked about, funnel back to a general set of rules that can be applied to everybody once they've reachieved a, a healthy state. And so, and of course, our our, um, our research partner and all that, Christopher Gardner, is just a super fun person mm-hmm. to interact with and do research with. So that's that's a really kind of fun, exciting part of, of science right now. But, the, you know, the other side of this that I think is really important and understudied is the um, microbiome of non-industrialized populations. There's just a huge bias in the data we have so far to microbiomes of people in the industrialized world. And it's very clear now that that microbiome of the industrialized world departs radically from the microbiome that our species evolved with over hundreds of thousands of years. And so the question is, what are the elements of our Micro, our ancestral microbiome, which we can get some sort of 
picture of by studying traditional populations. These are modern populations, but we know from sequencing coprolites, fossilized stool from ancient humans, that traditional populations actually have microbiomes that are similar to um, humans that lived, you know, thousands of years ago um, prior to industrialization. So if we expand the types of studies we do to study populations in um, parts of the world that are not industrialized with all of the important considerations for these indigenous populations that often lead a very vulnerable existence and making sure that they're taken care of. What can we learn about things that are important for human health that are fundamental to our identity as humans in terms of our microbial biology? I think that's going to be incredibly illuminating, both in terms of who we are as these ecological organisms, but also what is really important for human health. Yeah, that's that's going to be super exciting to see unfold. And I'm sure there's many, or well, hopefully lots of young scientists listening to this that are inspired by that and uh, want to get involved in this field of science. If folks listening would like to get in touch with you, learn more about your research or participate in some of your upcoming studies, if they uh, live in, in the right area, where should we direct them? So the, um, our lab has a webpage. It's the sonnenberglab.stanford.edu. Um, we also have a Center for Human Microbiome Studies. I will say that, you know, the study, we, there are a bunch of dietary studies that we want to do. And one of the big challenges in this field is actually getting the funding to do this. So even more important than participants are potential donors out there that'd be willing in funding, funding additional studies because we rely so much on philanthropic support to drive this science. I think the science we're doing is um, kind of uh, uh, departs from the traditional um, mission of a lot of the, the typical funding agencies um, that we really rely on um, on funding support. But at the Center for Human Microbiome Studies, you can figure out um, whether there is a study you want to take part in or if um, there's a um, potential uh, study that you'd want to fund. And of course, I highly recommend that everyone grabs a copy of your book, which covers a, a lot of uh, what we spoke about today and, and, and much, much more. So I'll put a link to that into the, the show notes as well. Wonderful. Uh, Erica, Justin, thank you so much. I know that I, I speak on behalf of this community. We're all very, very grateful for the work that both of you are doing and, and so incredibly fortunate to be able to hear from you today. So thank you for taking the, the time to do this. And uh, I really appreciate it and hope that we can continue the conversation in the future. Great talking with you, Simon. Yeah, thanks, thanks so, so much. much. Yeah. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.